Hello, everyone. You are currently listening to Bass Tunes on KUCI 88.9 FM in Irvine. I'm Arian Salimi, and we are currently at 200.1 watts. Now, today we're going to be talking about Chuck Person's Echo Jams Volume 1, an album that I consider to be the father of Vaporwave. Now, just as an aside and as a disclaimer, you're going to get some less energy from me on this episode. I don't feel well. I'm masked up in the studio. You know, we're keeping everybody safe. Washing my hands, science rinse and all that. It's whatever, but the show must go on, right? Or as Chris Pratt said in Parks and Recreation, the show must go wrong. And actually, I actually got done watching Parks and Recreation the other day. And my goodness, that is such a good show. I would love to talk about that one day. I put a poll of it on my Instagram, which is K, it is B-A-S-E-D-T-U-N-E-S on K-U-C-I. So Echo Jams, I call it the father of Vaporwave for a good reason, but we're gonna talk about what is Vaporwave first? Well, it's this sort of micro genre of electronic music. It comprises of slowed down samples of contemporary 80s work and a method more commonly known as plunder phonics, which is the reuse of notable music works as a sample to build off of. You might hear all the stuttering in the background. (coughs) No, you're not. You haven't adjusted your set. That's what it sounds like. And a comparison can and has been made to chopped and screwed music, which originates out of Houston, Texas in the 1990s because of its slowed speed, reverb, other effects, and the chopping and skipping of samples in order to create a new work. And there's like this aesthetic, other culture side of it, like, you know, neon, pink, like Windows 95, Fiji water, like tropical, early CGI landscape, stuff like that. And this doesn't really apply that much to Echo Jams, but a comparison, no. It's sort of attached to general culture. Vaporwave itself is sort of this critique of consumerist and capitalist culture in the 1980s. The sort of soulless vapidness of corporate Muzak, as they like to call it. This is interesting. In art, and it seems to be one of the first genres to be birthed and killed entirely online, and generally kind of has a dark and depressing tone. This song is playing right now. I'm actually going to play for you at the end, so I'm going to go ahead and skip it so you hear some with fresh eyes. Beautiful. So Echo Jams. Echo Jams was released on August 8, 2010 as a limited run cassette release by Chuck Person, a pseudonym of Daniel Lapadin, who is more commonly known as one of Tr- one of Tricks Point Never. There you go, I got it right. I I wrote I don't know how to pronounce that in my notes. And it was released shortly after his major label debut, Returnal on a different label to what he's currently signed to, which is Warp Records, home of other acts such as Broadcast, Boards of Canada, Aphex Twin, essentially some of my favorite artists, like, ever. So, this is great, right? But he first uploaded these videos in 2009, and the track A2, or Angel, as he says on the YouTube video under the channel Sunset Corp, seemed to have been sought as the first ever vaporwave work although the more popular one is the video nobody here which both of these songs and also demoral was another song and all of these ended up on the echo jams release this was released on a limited run cassette tape release so all the uploads on youtube are stuff with the exception of a few which are actually master tape rips by la Patton, although these aren't available anymore and the copy that you're hearing right now i had to scour a bunch of like it was like Soul Seek or something like that. This like weird, it was like the equivalent of LimeWire nowadays, and no one really uses it. But I got it, right? The mask tape rip. But most of them are these cassette rips, which are uploaded to YouTube and sometimes at the wrong speed. So if you don't listen to the one on YouTube, which is normal speed, it's actually slower. And you that might be more recognizable, but I assume the one that's the most accurate is the uploads on the Sunset Corp channel. Right now, I'm just trying to see. I know that uh, these videos were released on a video sort of thing. Oh, yeah, Memory Vague. It was an audio visual project in 2009, this DVD that has, like, it was sort of the beginning of the Vaporwave aesthetic. 
and a lot of these videos do use songs from Echo Jams, Angel and Nobody Here, or, yeah. Echo Jams is 15 songs, it's split over two cassette sides, so on most streaming services, well it's not on streaming, but on YouTube and things like that, it's available as A1, A2, A1 through 8, and B1 through 7, as it was originally released on a cassette tape, and that's where the sides would be from. And it has a primary sample, you can probably hear it in the background now, but it comprises of a sample, I really can't tell how this is sounding on my end. But if it was too loud in the beginning, my apologies. You can't really see it with the uh, the meter. Up that a bit. Yeah, there you go. That's better. <laughs> and it's a primary sample that's slowed down and repeated using distortion, flangers, reverb, and other effects to make this really hazy, nostalgic atmosphere of sound. And it's sort of being used as a way to create a new thing. Not super technical. It's mostly just some skipping. But like these optimistic tracks, it's like a snippet of a song, like a memory of a chorus or something in a song. And it's just repeated. That's what I really like about this album compared to a lot of other Vapor Wave albums that I feel like Echo Jams <clears throat> is sort of like that. Like it's the idea of a memory repeated over and over and over again. And tempo and pitch changes are wildly present on each track. It goes up and down in this like weirdly disconcerting atmosphere. A2, Angel, shifts a 4-4 time signature only over you by Fleetwood Mac into a 5-4 tempo song with like precision skipping and repeating to create a new tempo and rhythm for the track. And another thing, is that this album, to me, is sort of disconnected from the genre as a capitalist critique and the vaporwave aesthetics, to an extent, aside from the cover art, which is sort of a stretched out version of Echo the Dolphin, which is where the name is from, the Sega Genesis game in the 90s, which had this tropical atmosphere, but sort of shifts into this weird game about environmentalism and aliens, and is also notoriously difficult for no reason. I never played it, but it was one of the launch games on the Genesis, and along with stuff like Altered Beast, and then Sonic the Hedgehog came and just sort of blew those out of the water in terms of what was their killer app. But it sort of shifts between, like, this hopelessness, this dread, and this sort of comfort and soothingness. Usually within the same track, a lot of the tracks are sort of split down the middle. Like this track that's in the background right now, A3, has the be real, it doesn't matter anyway, you know it's just too little, too late. And then this beautiful, soothing repetition of castles in the sky. And B1 sort of has the same thing. This disconcerting atmosphere and then this refrain of don't give up now. Funny story, I actually never got to that part of the song until I was trying to fiddle. I was trying to fit a guitar strap on my plastic guitar, my Guitar Hero guitar, because I play Guitar Hero. And I also play the bass guitar, but I've been hopping on the plastic guitar more recently. But even the depressing tracks become horrific. The next track, Demerol, which is going to come up right now, is just... It's this bridge of a Michael Jackson song, where it says, Demerol, oh god, he's taking Demerol. Which I assume is some sort of opioid use. And then it turns into this ultimate, hazy, narcotic death atmosphere. With this, like, flanger and pitch shift towards the end. And the video that accompanies on the YouTube channel is like a guy basically just like stuck, lying on the couch in a state of paralyzing. Paralysis is the right word there. And that's just, it's freaky, man. It's freaky. I'm going to let this run for a second. One moment, please. You know I wouldn't let you guys have dead air, right? Absolutely not. We gotta have tunes. It's bass tunes. You can hear it sort of just... Fermenting is the word I'd describe. And... <clears throat> excuse me. And honestly, 
as much as I was going to talk about this album, I kind of ran out of stuff to say. But this does give me an opportunity to talk about the other album that sort of spawned Vaporwave, which is Macintosh Plus's Floral Shop. And I actually did want to cover this and sort of compare and contrast these two albums. So, yeah, we got that now. This headset is not great. This is Jack System. This is a sample of Tar Baby by Sade. And this track, you don't know it. The the Lisa Frank 420 Modern Computing one is the one that everyone knows. The da, 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 da. But this album was sort of the birth of like Vaporwave as it would become as a genre. I would still say Echo Jams is the first Vaporwave album, but this sort of solidified it was iconic in the genre. In, this, in the landscape of the micro genre. This was created by, as I said, Macintosh Plus, which is an alias of an alias. Same with Chuck Person being an alias of one of Tricks Point Never, which is an alias for Danny Lopatin. Macintosh Plus is an alias for Vectroid, which is an alias for a woman named Ramona Xavier. This was released in 2011, and under the, I believe, the Beer on the Rug Bandcamp label, which also had another great prototypical Vaporwave album in 2011 called Midnight Television, which feels more like just browsing television late at night, 2 a.m. And that's sort of the aesthetic that I think Vaporwave really conveys. It's like that sort of tired feeling. You're like a kid. You have a CRT TV. You're, you're in like the 90s at the point where 24-hour television thing and television stations hadn't been signing off into static. So you'd be like flicking through channels, watching all the infomercials. And it's like that late night comforting atmosphere of old technology. Vaporwave as a genre, generally, its main goal is nostalgia. It brings in this atmosphere of pure just dread, honestly. It's like a dark memory of nostalgia. Nostalgia not being as good as you might have thought. And that's an interesting thought. We look at a lot of things, I think, with rose-colored glasses. And... I'm not sure if that's the right thing to do. Rose-colored glasses as nostalgia. You can look at things and wish for them, but you also sort of lose what is the truth with regards to nostalgia. I think a good example of this, to an extent, is, and honestly, I'm going to get my thoughts out of Floorshop out of the way so I can start talking about what's really on my mind right now, which is this. So Floral Shop. It's less, it feels less human. It feels more artificial because it was made in Audacity, the free audio manipulation software, as opposed to Echo Jam, which was created live on audio tapes. It's a little choppy, and these songs go on for too long, and they run the samples down a lot. And I don't think each song has as much impact as Echo Jam's does. They're not as hard hitting. But I do think. Lisa Frank 420 is still a good song. I like this intro one called, I think, Boot Up. And the Japanese lettering, I mean, there, there's the aesthetic. Like, the Japanese lettering, the pink, the, you know, Betamax VHS stuff. That sort of all started with that. But nostalgia. Well, speaking of nostalgia, a lot of people are mad. I don't know if a lot of people are mad. But let's talk about something that I want to talk about. Godzilla and King Kong coming to Call of Duty Warzone. I was gonna talk about this game franchise one of these days, and I think now is the time where I've been, you know, I've been a little under the weather, and we're going straight from the hip. My goodness, this is gonna be great. So, this year's COD game, or 2021's game, was Vanguard. This is a first-person shooter series, y'all know it. And the, the thing is, this is a World War II game, sort of a reboot of the World War II game that Sledgehammer made, which is one of the development studios, and they're the one that made this game as the developers, right? They work on a three-year cycle, but this last few years of COD has been kind of a mess cycle-wise, partially because of the pandemic, partially because Sledgehammer was going to make a game for 2020, but they couldn't agree with the other studio they're working for. So Activision, you know, the heads, Bobby Kotick, scumlord that he could be. Just my opinion. He, they ripped him, they they ripped them off and then put him to use. Uh, 
They put Treyarch to try to fill the shoes of Activision. I mean, Sledgehammer. So they had to rush a game. They had to drop all content for their game, which came out in 2018. So they've been overworked for a long time. And Sledgehammer was put to work on this World War II game. So it's rushed. It's rushed. And what makes it really funny to me is that if this is the year that they decided to just basically drop all pretense of this being a realistic game, the year that they're setting in 1944, there's like futuristic guns in the new season. There's an operator that looks straight out of the 2025 game, the game that was set in 2025, which is weird for me to think that like Black Ops 2, that game was set in 2025, and we're in 2022. We're not nearly at that level of advancement technologically. People sort of overestimate what the future is going to be. But yeah, there's been teasers for a while, leaks in the files, that Godzilla is going to come. The Kaiju Monster. And also, for some reason, there's a Godzilla vs. Kong movie, but this is coming out a decent amount of time after the movie came out. So I guess they're trying to promote the franchise regardless and timing or whatever. But the map is an island. It is in Hawaii. I guess Godzilla is sort of a byproduct of, like, the, the nuclear aspect of World War II around that time, Cold War-ish stuff. So maybe that's true. Maybe that would work, but... We've had Levi from Attack on Titan, who looks terrible. We've had the Armored Titan. We've had futuristic guns straight out of Valorant, like a game that's totally fictional in the future. We've had Snoop Dogg. Snoop freaking Dogg came out the day before 420. Snoop Dogg, and yes, I bought him, and he ta and he talks, and he's cool as and he's cool, man, and oh my goodness, I'm having a great time. Just like I'm astonished at the sheer lack of care for realism. Personally, I don't mind. I think cosmetics and games are really fun if you can go all out. Like we can talk about like Fortnite, where they got like Jinx from Arcane. The you know we got League of Legends characters. You got Marvel. DC, you got everything. It's like the, it's like the Smash Bros of a third-person game. There's sliding, so now you're gonna have to slide cancel like in Warzone. It's a lot. It's crazy. But the new map, I mean, I guess no one really plays Warzone anymore. To me, it got a big resurgence with the Rebirth Reinforced update, which redid like the main mode that a lot of people switched to, which is the respawn mode, where essentially. If you're down, as long as one of your squad mates is alive, you can redeploy up until like a certain point in the game, and then it, you know, that gets cut off. But they redid the mode, they redid the announcer, they redid the UI, and they beefed up the map with some new areas, slightly new lighting, reinforcing certain spots, literally. I mean, the security area got turned to a stronghold, but still no one drops there. Which is pretty funny, because I think when the map first came out, it used to be like a death trap. Not anymore. But, yeah, the main map, Caldera, no one liked. And I'll talk about this for a bit because I think it's important. In December, we finally got a original map for the game since the release in March of 2020. March of 2021, or April, I believe, we got the 1984 version of the previous map, which is more of a, re more of a rework than an actual update of the map. Like, it wasn't a brand new map. It was, like, a rework. The entire thing got, like, a makeover texture-wise. The lighting got changed to this ugly shade of green of, like, Dark Knight Rises-esque color correction. Interior lighting is better, but you get this, like, massive shift in color palette and tone when you go inside buildings. Like, it's predetermined. Certain areas are darker. Like, people... And the textures, some of it are remained from the 2020 map, like the map that's supposed to take place in the modern day. Certain new areas were done, certain more paths were added, more cover. It was cleaner. It was a better map. There was new areas added. Aside from the color correction differences, which I, I think ruined it, to be honest with you, it looked really good. Like, it was, a, it, it was a better version of the original map, and it was fun. But I still played Rebirth because I like respawning, and I like the chaotic action. And like just being able to go in and just have a chance at some warfare, you know what I mean? But in December, Caldera comes out. 
And it's a totally brand new map. It's no longer an urban environment. It's in a Hawaiian island. There's a lot more open areas. There's more space between points of interest. And people... More people kind of hate it nowadays, which I think is pretty funny. I'm not sure why. I actually do know why. People are... It's the rose-colored glasses. People were hating on this Verdansk map until they got something new. They're like, oh my god, I want the old map back. Ugh. And maybe part of it was better. And I think the areas were more recognizable in a cool way. Like, I know uh, PUBG, PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds, the first Battle Royale game, that had realistic environments. But I will admit, when I first downloaded Warzone in, like, 2020, well, I had the game installed, but when I when it finally unlocked for me, it was crazy. I was like, oh my goodness, I can drop into a train station? I can, dr I can go to a TV station? I can go to an airplane hangar, like, everything was super realistic. It felt like I was running through an actual city. And coincidentally, finding weapons out of crates and, you know, attacking enemies. So that was amazing. Obviously, I think there's always going to be a loss in player count, especially because the pandemic sort of forced people to have a game that everyone could stay at home and have fun in. And that was the game for a lot of people. And now everyone's going back to normal. Everyone's back to their regular scheduled, pro regularly scheduled program. And that's just how it is. But I think the game is still doing well financially. It's just for me personally, I'm in Southern California. I'm near LA. And I have trouble getting into a match. It takes me like a minute and a half to get on the Caldera. But it's basically instantaneous when I queue up for Rebirth. So either people really like Rebirth or probably it's due to the lower player count. The map pause is 40 versus like 150 plus on Caldera. But we're not going to worry about it for much longer. Next year, 2023... We're getting a totally new Warzone game. None of your content is going to carry over. So I thought, why would I purchase any content if I can't use it next year? Part of the appeal for me was, hey, if I buy this, this skin, I can use it next year. And I was able to. I still use the stuff from the first generation, 2019. But it's all right. But they reeled me in with the Attack on Titan skin and Snoop Dogg. So basically, I'm a sucker for consumerist greed. I'm a capitalist pig kind of antithetical to the genre of music I'm I was talking about today, huh? Vaporwave. Strange days we are at. Strange days we are at. One moment. There's some other good Vaporwave albums that I really like, too. 2814's Birth of a New Day is really good, although it's more of an ambient dream punk album, but it does have the elements of Vaporwave. Blank Banshee is Vapor Trap, which is more trap-infused. And another good Vapor Trap album is Vaporo's Mamna Pool. That was some crazy stuff. That was a lot of what I was listening to back in like middle school and early high school, in addition to <laughs> Pink Guy's Pink Season. And then when I was a freshman, I got put on to Tyler the Creator. It took me a long time to get put on Tyler the Creator, which is kind of funny because I feel like if I was a kid, because one of my good friends, Jack, hey, Jack, if you're listening, I love you, buddy. I hope everything's going well. You're a homie. This guy I went to elementary school with, right? We've known each other for a long time. And I remember he always had an OF sticker on his phone and like on his wallpaper. And I was like, I never asked him, but I was always wondering, what is that OF donut? What is of? And of course, that was Tyler the Creator's collective. But that was a time where Odd Future was still kind of a thing. If I was in it at that point... And, like, I was super into old Eminem, like, the Slim Shady LP, like, the cartoony, the vulgar, the violent stuff. I just couldn't believe it. But I got into stuff like Tron Cat. That song was gross. I still like the Earl album. I still like it. I really do. Earl's first tape is honestly one of my favorite pieces of work from him. I like some rap songs. I like... I don't like S. I don't go outside. But... Those are honestly very depressing, and I kind of like the lo-fi aesthetic of, like, the crunchiness of Earl's beats and the cartoonish lyricism. I'm a big fan of just cartoony lyrics. I'm not going to lie to you. Because the reason why I really like the Slim Shady LP, and I'm not going to talk about it that much on the show, and I can't play songs from it because it's vulgar and it's A-play. I mean, B-play. But it feels like I'm watching a cartoon, and I've been called out for, like, you know, Eminem's corny, Weezer's corny. Looking at you, Josh. But... I think we should embrace the corn, honestly. 
it's good to just let loose and have fun. And that's a message that I want to give out to the people. Is just let loose. Have fun. Don't, just don't pay attention. It doesn't matter what others think of you. Just do your thing as long as you aren't hurting anybody. And that's a big disclaimer. Because people saying, oh, being brutally honest. Oh, I can do what I want. You, you probably shouldn't do that if you're hurting other people or like discriminating or making people feel bad. But if you're just doing your thing and you're just living your life and you're being fiercely independent and not really giving a heck about anything. That's all good, man. Live your life. This album's pretty interesting. Echo Jams. Man, Echo Jams. That album is a beauty and a joy to behold. In a little bit, I think now is probably the best time to close this thing out because as you can tell I'm not in the best state we are rambling but I was having fun I was talking about something I was passionate about so frankly I don't mind in the slightest but thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of Bass Tunes I'm Arian Salimi you're listening to KUCI 88.9 FM in Irvine a current meter reading 200.1 200.1 watts still. I know it's not necessary, but I like it. And we're going to fade you out, and we're going to be playing A2, or Angel, from Chuck Person's Echo Jams Volume 1 to close you out. And be ready for the next show, A Sunny Day in Orange with Mana Young. I don't know what she's cooking up, but it's probably going to be good. All right. Follow Bass Tunes KCI on Instagram, B-A-S-E-D-T-U-N-E-S, KCI, if you want more content. And have a good day. The opinions and views expressed in this program do not reflect those of KUCI, its management, or the UC Board of Regents. Thank you.